Thank you. So um, this is a map. On this map, people grow, grow their own food. Um, parents teach their kids to be kind to themselves and to other people. Uh, in school, they teach them to open their minds and their hearts. On this map, um, there is so much kindness and abundance and peace. Um, even people can taste the color purple. Uh, this is the map of the Middle East, and it does stand in contrast to the uh, Middle East that we know of and hear about um, in news all day, because uh, it's a map that only exists in our head, uh, in my head, in the heads of my team. And um, we invented it basically four years ago by taking the best parts of the Middle East and putting them together to create this whole new utopic reality. <coughs> and um, at the time, uh, the Arab Spring was happening, uh, but before that, we were kind of really sick and tired of the narratives coming out of that region. Um, and kind of portraying it as a place where it's impossible to pretty much do anything. Um, and we wanted to create a whole new media platform that challenges this, this narrative of impossibility. So we created The Outpost, a magazine of possibilities. And the idea was that we wanted to use first print as a kind of a platform to present various narratives of possibility to kind of like shift people's perspectives and maybe inspire them to do good. Um, so in every issue of the magazine, we present a different possibility and we dissect it uh, within the framework of the three sections, which are what's happening, what's not happening, and what could happen. This was our very first issue in which we presented the map I told you about. Um, we had the scissors on the cover because, and, and it said how a pair of scissors took us from Beirut to Jerusalem. The border between Lebanon and Israel is closed. So we kind of used this as a metaphor to show how we used, how we created our own map to kind of like dream our own um, uh, reality or future. Um, so, and then we took this a step further and we commissioned a young author to write a story that takes place in this new world we created. And this story became a, a, a small novel that, we, uh, that became a supplement inside our first, very first issue. So in, the, in, the, in this whole new attempt, we were definitely trying to explore um, the, the limits of, of stories, how narratives can really, or if narratives can impact the world somehow. Um, but we're also, we wanted to start journalistic, journalistically exploring new formats. Um, in this story, uh, it's about this band which started in Beirut um, five years ago in one of the university campuses. Um, and somehow through their lyrics and music, they kind of captured the, moods, the mood of, 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 of young people at the time. And the, and the, the lead singer is, a, is an open gay man. So they really kind of pushed um, the, the edge. And they were invited to uh, perform at this ginormous music festival in, in Lebanon, which was uh, considered to be as a place where only uh, the greats would sing. And here was a band, super controversial band, being asked to perform there. So we felt that this is, there's the, our society was, was at, at the cusp of some grand changes. So what we did, and we knew about the story before it broke in the media, so we sent one of our writers to basically shadow the band for the six months before they performed. Um, she lived with them, went to the rehearsals and traveled with them. And what came out of that experience is what I believe a timeless story that really depicts uh, that period in time. Um, so that was one, one format. Another format is this, for example, where we asked what could happen if more people in our society started dancing. So from there, uh, we put out the first issue and it kind of really got incredible, overwhelming feedback. At the end of the day, we were a bunch of young people trying to put our ideas out there, but we didn't really, in, our, in, our, in the wildest of our dreams, imagine that it they would actually, those ideas would have a little dent 
um, in the world. Um, so we were actually encouraged to make another issue. Um, and this one was about, we wanted to use the theme of movement as a, as a starting point to explore a lot of uh, concepts. Uh, so we started the, with how people move in their own cities. So we sent different writers in different Arab cities to spend the day on one form of public transport. So here's a writer in Beirut, he spent a whole day uh, on a public bus. And out of those experiences came really bri brilliant uh, essays that, that, that explore and, uh, and, and examine the, the fabric of our societies. Um, as I said, we used movement as an anchor to uh, zone in very different issues. So for example, we wanted to talk about the injustices that sex workers suffer in Beirut. So we used um, uh, their, uh, basically, uh, th like the, the, their journey from the minute they come to Lebanon to the minute their visa expires. And on every touch point in the journey, we zoned in on the various injust injustices. Uh, this is a story about how uh, the garbage in Cairo moves, and then we use that to talk about the recycling initiatives um, uh, th that's happening there. We also s had stories about how revolutions move, how borders move, and we even created our own, um, another utopic attempt at connecting the world. So we dismantled all the borders that uh, exist between the countries in the Middle East, and we created um, rail maps that connect the different cities based on rail maps that used to exist or ones that are currently being built or, or ones that are perhaps uh, being proposed for the future. And the highlight of this issue was a children's book that we published uh, as a supplement in the issue because we felt that when we're talking about movement and how can we as a humanity move forward, um, we felt that there are so many issues plaguing us as a society that it feels we need an entire new generation to grow up and be able to fix this place. So we um, uh, published this, this children's book that promotes ideas of tolerance and peace and justice and kindness. And um, our idea also was to kind of print more of it and distribute in uh, different schools across the region. Uh, so after that, that second issue, things started to becoming more serious. Uh, people were picking up the magazine, we were getting very good feedback, and uh, we needed to start thinking about how to actually continue this magazine. So um, that, uh, come the first problem, which was financial. So basically how the magazine world works is that an advertiser pays money, and then the magazine would make money and be able to print. But in our case, we were a bunch of young independent kids who had no access to the corporate uh, cycle. We didn't know any advertisers. And in the odd case, when we managed to actually convince an advertiser to put an ad with us, that would be the outcome. I can't even, I can't even look at it. So, um, then, um, we kind of like, we found our way, like we started finding bits and pieces of money to print the third issue, um, which was about the idea that we started exploring was why are so many people leaving the Arab world to elsewhere? If everyone leaves, uh, what will happen? But then we were like, if we're actually inviting them to stay and do something, we're pretty much inviting them to stay in a place that's in many ways unlivable. So the issue became about the possibility of living in the Arab world. Um, and with our research, um, trying to find people who have actually stayed and are doing something meaningful and impactful to the community, um, we found that uh, there, are so many there are so many people who are doing that. So we decided to call them world makers because they're inventing their own worlds against all the odds, really. There is no infrastructure for support. Uh, there is nothing. They're building their worlds from scratch. So we call them world makers. But then we decided to take this a step further. And we were like, what if all these world makers are connected somehow? What would the, be the impact like? So we embarked on this mission to connect all those world makers with that we profiled in the issue. And the idea was that if one world maker is doing good, and they're connected to another world, world maker to is, who is doing good, then the whole region is going to flourish because it's inhabited by all those world makers. 
that are really strongly pushing to make the world a better place. So here we show how all the connections are made and it was really like, it was a nightmare. Um, and then the issue was divided based on different, we zoned in on different clusters of, the, of this big network and had relevant stories. So for example, these are the world makers who are opening safe spaces for people to come and just like hang out and be themselves and especially in hostile and violent environments. Uh, this one was about the, the, the people who believe in the power of stories, uh, be it film, filmmakers, storytellers, media people, like um, uh, people working in theater, uh, hackers, and we had like eight others. Um, and then after, after that issue was out, we, ha we started realizing that we have another problem. Um, and it occurred to me that uh, when you go to a bookstore, you would find like a section uh, in the magazine section, you would find a subsection for the business magazines and then the subsection for architecture magazine or travel or whatnot. But where would you place a magazine of possibilities? Um, so it occurred to me that that's how, that's how the, like, the industry works. The distributors send out magazines in bulk and then the bookshops put them based on what they know. But increasingly as new independent magazines come out and blur the boundaries between genres, um, I think the whole, the whole, the whole um, channel um, or the whole process, retail process needs to be uh, reimagined. Um, so after that issue, uh, we started thinking about our fourth, and uh, which would basically uh, mark our first year in print. And we wanted to explore new ways of telling stories and engaging our readers. Um, and we realized at the time that there are so many people who are just ho lost and hopeless in, in that region. Uh, they've completely lost hope and they feel helpless. And we wanted to uh, create a campaign that, um, so we called it the Tear Down This Wall campaign. And the idea was that uh, to get people to think about the different walls that stand in between them and their possibilities. And we had multi, like, it was multi layered, so we had like different, so we had also stickers where people would actually stick the, uh, stick it on wherever they feel or whatever they feel is preventing them from moving forward. And these are some of the campaign visuals. Uh, this is the parliament, the borders, sexual harassment, unemployment. Uh, but then what we did is that we kind of built on the momentum of this campaign to construct issue number four. Uh, which became about getting lost. And we wanted to use the idea of getting lost as a method or a notion or like a, a way of <coughs> positively thinking about problem solving. So whereas being lost is a state of utter depression and lostness, getting lost is, the way, is a way where you really get out of your way to find new solutions to existing problems. So uh, building on that campaign that we did, uh, we presented this whole narrative of the, like being lost versus getting lost, and we had all those different icons and like. Um, so yeah, we did like this whole manifesto on getting lost. Uh, we also experimented with uh, like content forms. So we created this some this which is called the content paragraph, and it's basically a table of content. Uh, but uh, written in a paragraph. And each phrase in this paragraph uh, denotes a story inside the magazine. Um, sorry, it's like uh, layered, but I couldn't find the, the proper file. And this is um, yeah, just for printing. Um, and also we uh, created something called the flood bar because we realized that although our issues were conceptual, we start with the concept or with the theme and we build an entire issue around it. 
sometimes the stories can be so far off from each other that it, uh, it's not easy, easy for the reader to understand the link between the theme and the story. So the flood bar basically floods from the top section bar of the issue and um, uh, tell the reader how can they get lost in relation to the story in question. In this story, we send different writers to get lost for 24 hours in different cities. Uh, we also sent a writer to get lost in a library. And here, we wanted to show how our cities are being lost to real estate moguls and like all this crazy development that's going on. So we sent different writers with a picture in their, of a, in their own cities with a picture of a building that no longer exists. And they went around town asking people for directions to get to that building. And then the, the, the encounters and the interactions turned into stories which we published in the Getting Lost issue. Um, just a quick story about this check, which uh, one day I was walking in Beirut and they came across this pile of books on the uh, uh, sidewalk. And I started flipping through them. And in one of the books, I found this check. Uh, which in Arabic basically it pays its recipient 365 days of happiness. And I like took this check and I was like, wow. Um, but we couldn't like research the story, but we fa at the time we were building issue, uh, the getting lost issue, but found that uh, we didn't have an idea for the cover and we were like, we, let's put the check on the cover. So we did. Um, and then after the issue was out, the daughter of the dude who used to issue these checks called me up and she was like, hey, this is my dad. And I'm like, wow, I've, like, I've been looking for you and your dad. And she was like, my dad passed away. Um, but he used to issue these checks 25, 30 years ago. And the last one he did was before the war broke in Beirut. And then what we did is we actually, uh, I don't have a picture, but we made them into an actual checkbox and we started selling them. Uh, as a way to kind of uh, finance printing the magazine. Uh, and after this issue, like really exploring very different concepts, we uh, uh, encountered uh, a third uh, problem, uh, which is a creative problem. And basically, as the magazine world worked for so long, was that an editor would edit and an, an designer designs. Um, but in our case, we were working with like really big concepts and they were very much like we we're spending so much time in Beirut coming up with concepts and constructing an issue conceptually and then export because our design team was in Spain and then exporting all those concepts to Spain to be laid out. And it wasn't making any sense for us. And then it kind of hit me that maybe we need to centralize our design and our actually our creative operation in Beirut, um, where everyone from editors to designers to uh, writers to artists, engineers, programmers, everyone can come together in the process of constructing an issue. Because what we're really constructing is something much grander uh, in that sense. Uh, like in our uh, current issue, um, which saw a doctor join us on board to help us out, the body issue, um, which you can find um, at Sebastian's uh, stand outside. Um, uh, we wanted, basically, we're always talking about changing uh, other people and changing this and changing that. Um, but we never talk about changing ourselves, and that was the like really the primary reason why I wanted to do an issue about the about the, about the body at a time when our bodies also are being subjected to so much violence and terror and um, uh, toxic waste. Uh, but we so how we started as I said we worked with a doctor who explained to us how each system of the body works, so how the muscular system works, how the circulatory system works, etc. And then from the biological working of each system, we kind of extrapolated the philosophical layer. Um, so, uh, so this is the table of contents. Uh, we had like each uh, system uh, represented by an object. Um, and then uh, this is the sub, like these are the subsections. This was about, I think, the I forgot which system, but we had basically stories. Oh, this is the di di digestive system. And then the, it became about renewal. And we had stories that were relevant to this uh, philosophical scope, if you will. 
Uh, yeah, and in this issue, we decided to uh, stop publishing advertising uh, because it was really a point when we really came to the, like, um, we embraced the fact that this is not working and it's never going to work for us. Uh, so we took a picture of all the objects, each uh, denoting um, uh, a system, and we put them on the back cover. Uh, so if you, if you ask me how we're actually making money, uh, one of the things we're doing is we're actually leveraging our creative, um, uh, like what we can deliver uh, creatively to other organizations. So we developed this book for one of the cultural organizations in Beirut. Uh, we did this booklet for uh, the Central Bank in Lebanon. And uh, one of the things we're currently experimenting uh, with is a concept paper. Uh, a concept paper, basically, as its name implies, is a paper that explores a concept. Uh, and it's like a poster-like uh, paper that goes inside our issue, but it's basically paid for by someone who wants their concept explored. Uh, it's like um, subverted advertising somehow, but it's our way of um, um, finding funds to continue printing the magazine. Um, okay, so as I said, um, uh, this is basically the process that used to, or the three interactions that made um, the magazine as we know it. Um, and I focused on the relationship between design and editor, which I believe is the, uh, like the focus of this conference. Um, and I think like really, I w like just want to end quickly. Um, uh, I think the world has changed so much, but still, in many ways, uh, the world has gotten like really complex, but we're still using very, as far as magazine making is concerned, um, we're still using um, very uh, simple processes or linear processes to um, respond to this complex world. Uh, it took us a couple of issues to kind of realize that, but now we're trying to find uh, to really embrace the complexity of the world and uh, reflect that in the, in the different processes involved in making the magazine. Um, but while so much has changed indeed in the past 60 or 70 years in terms of a magazine, I believe, and its processes in the world and everything, I believe that one thing hasn't changed at all, uh, which is the magazine itself. Um, today it remains as it was 70 years ago, um, a package of surprises, really. Uh, come down to it, that's what the magazine is. Now this package of surprise can become a record of time, like, as, like the 60s Esquire now is. Uh, it's a perfect, um, like, it's a history book. It perfectly captured the evolving zeitgeist of the 60s era in America. Uh, they captured the mood of that generation. Uh, it's just phenomenal what this magazine back in the day was able to do by documenting uh, history as it was being made. Um, also, magazines are engines of ideas, as uh, Marx spoke about colors, and I don't know how colors maybe was an engine of idea back then, but I, I'm more familiar with colors under Patrick, um, like the recent colors, and I really feel that magazines can be those platforms that pump up new ideas to the world because the world really needs them, especially today. And finally, I think magazines are laboratories of social or economic or political, or whatever, activism, um, because they can present new ideas and get people excited about them and like get the balls of change rolling. Uh, so I don't have time to talk about this issue in which we created a radio station and like completely fictitious and ended up publishing it and then people thought it was true. But, um, <laughs> uh, okay, I'll end on this note. Uh, so as I said, um, Tina Brown says, the former editor of The New Yorker says that if you don't have a budget, have a point of view. And I think the world uh, is in dire need for new points of views today because everything is failing. All the systems we are used to, education, political, economic, cultural systems are failing us. And we need new methods to kind of propose new points of view uh, for the future. Because as I always say, we're not just making magazines, we're making prototypes um, of the kind of world we want to live in. Thank you.